across uh, um, our neuroscience research training program seminar and a variety of participants, in addition to our guest lecturer today, Rachel Kember, from University of Pennsylvania, who are um, you know, interested, have both affiliated with a new kind of joint pet imaging center focused on opiate use disorder, um, and, and, um, and the division of substance abuse there, um, including, I see on the screen here, George Woody, Chuck O'Brien, Anna Rose Childress, um, I don't know if um, if Hank Kranzler's logged on, but he assured me he was gonna he he wanted to attend as well. Um, uh, the NRTP is a T32 funded research training program in psychiatry. Uh, it's for uh, psychiatry residents interested in pursuing careers in neurobiologically oriented research. Um, it was started. It really dates back to the time of Floyd Bloom and Danny Friedman and evolved and ultimately taken over by George Henninger, passed on to me and soon to be inherited by Chris Pittenger. And uh, we have anywhere from two to three psychiatry residents per year in the track. Um, so it's usually a small group former. Um, we were delighted to have it expanded today though. And um, I don't know your preference, you know, Rachel, on the one hand, we wanna record this. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a record there for people at Penn. Um, our style tends to be one of um, accommodating uh, questions and interruptions during the talk, though. I don't know if that's okay with you. That's, that's totally fine by me. And then I'll defer to others here. I think there's some Zoom features that enable people to either log in with their voice, you know, unmute their mic and ask a question, or I think there might be, is there a raising hand feature in Zoom? that allows you to signal, I think. Yes, it, yes it, there is a raise your hand signal. Yeah, if I, I see it when I open up my participants bar. I don't know if, where it is in others of you, but if I open up my participants bar, I can see that on the right. And then down there's bottom, there's some invite mute me or raise hand. So um, anyway, well, listen. Um, Let's go ahead and get started. You know, it gives me really great pleasure today to have uh, Rachel Kember uh, join us. Um, um, Rachel's a, a, a research assistant professor from the University of Pennsylvania. She hails from the UK where she uh, got her degrees in, I think, uh, uh, social genetic behavior um, from uh, uh, King's College in London. And uh, she's here to tell us all about polygenic risk scores and uh, their use in substance use disorders. So thanks for coming, Rachel. Thank, thank you very much for the uh, invite. And um, I'm very excited to present this, this work to, to the group, um, especially to psychiatry residents, um, to, to get your, your feedback and, and thoughts. And um, please do uh, interrupt as, as I go along to ask any questions that you have. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I see the uh, hand raising feature. So if anyone else um, sees that and sees that someone wants to ask a question, just, just shout out and, and let me know. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about these polygenic risk scores for substance use disorders and whether or not they're, they're ready for prime time. You know, are these um, things that we can start deploying in, in the clinic? Um, so just to give you a brief outline, um, I'm going to start with an incredibly brief history of psychiatric genetics, one slide, um, talk to you a little bit about GWAS studies, um, look at uh, biobanks and introduce the use of electronic health records, um, introduce phenome-wide association studies, describe polygenic risk scores, and then finish with some conclusions and next steps. So here is our very brief history of psychiatric genetics. So my uh, main research interest is the study of the role of genetics in psychiatric conditions. And this is work that began many years ago, um, principally with linkage studies, which use um, the co-segregation of genetic regions in families, um, which, which contains affected and unaffected individuals. 
Um, it then moved on to candidate gene studies. So uh, genes were selected based on biological information um, and then they were tested for association with disorder. And then there are a few number of single variant association studies with small numbers of cases and controls. Um, these uh, had varying levels of success. And so there was also a suggestion to possibly look at endophenotypes, um, phenotypes that would lie uh, between um, the, the genetics and the um, psychiatric uh, outcome. Um, and then also the suggestion that maybe including the environment and looking at gene environment interactions, knowing studies. that a genetic background um, alone doesn't um, completely cause disorder. Um, the issue with all of these was that a small number of associations were found and when associations were found, the variants and the genes were not consistently replicated. And so this really led um, to GWAS studies. Um, so GWAS is a genome-wide association study and the first um, GWAS was um, performed in 2005. Um, it followed on from the first full human genome sequence in 2003. And what this really does is it just has a, a set of cases and a set of controls and you measure common genetic variants in all of your cases and controls and you test to say, is this genetic variant more or less common in cases compared to controls? So it's just looking at the allele frequency and seeing if there's an allele frequency difference. As these uh, GWAS were performed, um, we realized that larger and larger samples were needed um, in order to identify associations. And so consortia such as the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium have been formed um, in order to pull samples from smaller studies. And these larger sample sizes have yielded a greater number of significant results. And now we are seeing that increasing numbers of genetic variants are now replicated across studies. And so here um, on the left, I am showing you uh, schizophrenia GWAS from a few years ago, which identified a number of different associations. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with, with these plots, although I'm sure most are, um, this is a, a Manhattan plot. So along the x-axis, you have um, all of the chromosomes. Each dot is um, a, a particular genetic variant um, on the chromosome. And then on the y-axis is the p-value of the association with phenotype. So the, the higher the peak, um, the more associated uh, that variant is with phenotype. Um, on the right, we have um, a plot from a more recent schizophrenia GWAS with, with a much larger sample size. And you can see now that we're getting many, many more peaks and many more genetic variants associated. So another uh, spanner in the works um, on uh, exploring psychiatric and substance use disorders is the fact there are many comorbidities, um, both psychiatric and medical comorbidities that commonly co-occur. Um, and there may be many reasons um, for these comorbidities, but one potential reason is the existence of pleiotropy. So, these are genetic variants that affect multiple unrelated phenotypes. Um, now there's two reasons that we may see pleiotropy. On the left, I'm showing you a horizontal pleiotropy. So this is where a single genetic variant independently um, associates with two different phenotypes. Um, on the right, I'm showing you vertical pleiotropy. So this is where a genetic variant associates with one phenotype and then that phenotype increases or decreases risk for a second phenotype. And one way to explore uh, the pleiotropy that exists is to use phenome-wide association analysis and I'll um, talk you through uh, exactly what that means later on in the slides. So the solution to being able to identify genetic variants uh, associated with substance use disorders and the fact that there are multiple comorbidities um, 
really leads us into using biobanks and electronic health records for research. So there are many different commercial and academic biobanks, um, often consisting of hundreds of thousands of samples. Um, these can be uh, academic at a single institution, such as the Penn Medicine Biobank, um, which is one of these studies I'll show you today. Um, they can be population-based, such as the UK Biobank, um, or they can be hospital-based um, and collected across many different locations, such as the Million Veteran Programme. Um, does anyone have any questions so far about uh, any of the work I've introduced? Rachel, the, you may be coming to this later, but another challenge we have with pleiotropy is that our phenotypes are lousy, meaning that our, our uh, diagnoses aren't real entities, they're fuzzy syndromes with complex boundaries. So it may be that there is a clean phenotype that has a clean genetic signature, but we're not measuring it. We are instead measuring multiple fuzzy entities that overlap with it. And I, that, that doesn't seem to be quite the same. It's sort of a different way to think about pleiotropia. I don't know if you're going to get to that later if you want to comment on it. Um, on, only very briefly in, in my next steps. Um, that's, that's not something I'll be presenting on today, but there, there has been um, work, I don't know if you've seen um, a recent paper, I think it was on bioarchives, um, that looked at a less specific definition for major depression and found that when they used this sort of fuzzier definition, the genetic variants that they identified as associated were really um, uh, sort of general genetic variants that also conferred risk for many other phenotypes. And so it was certainly picking up some of that uh, fuzziness. In, well, in some, some of the recent cross disorder things have suggested that you may have, you know, risk factors for brain badness, you know, sort of general psychiatric distress factors, which may actually yeah. carry more of the variants than any specific thing. Yeah. So just the underlying structure of psychiatric diagnosis is a further complication. Yes, definitely. That's, that's a very good point to, to mention here. Thank you. This is Renato. Uh, if, if, if I can add the uh, something is uh, also that we can use the genetic correlation to determine if our phenotypes uh, are really specific or they are fuzzy. Like, for example, with PTSD and depression, we can see that they are two different things. Uh, also, if the, the phenotype definition is really heterogeneous, because their genetic correlation is not that high. So we have a strong genetic correlation, but it's not 100%. So mm -hmm. that's something that there are ways we can use genetic <laughs> to determine how good are our phenotypes. But the, the brainstorm analysis that was published last year did exactly that across a lot of psychiatric and neurological disorders and found relatively high correlations across psychiatric diagnosis relative to neurological ones. So it, it, I mean, not that high depends on what you compare it to. If yes. you compare to the is neurological a diagnoses, all of our diagnoses have a lot of cross correlation. Yeah, but th that's because of, 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 of pleiotropy. It's not because of the phenotypes are, are bad. Because also when we are really careful about the phenotypes, we still see uh, genetic overlap. And sometimes we see genetic overlaps between disorders that are, they, from a phenotypic point of view, they are not shared, there is not comorbidity. So like pleiotropy is independent from the phenotype definition. Okay, um, thank you. Any, any other? points or questions? No? Okay. Um, so, uh, coming back to these electronic health records, and actually this um, is, a, is a great segue into discussion of, of these phenotypes. Um, of course, electronic health records are using um, health record data that hasn't necessarily been collected for research. And so our aim um, in all of our genetic studies is to establish a set of cases and controls for genetic analysis. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to two main methods. Um, the first is the use of fee codes, which allow us to perform phenome-wide association studies. And then the other, uh, which I'll briefly touch on, is the development of EHR-derived phenotypes using domain knowledge. 
Um, so both of these methods that I'll talk to you about um, really start with these uh, international classification of disease codes. Um, as I'm sure you all know, um, every disease uh, has an ICD code and these can either be ICD-9 or ICD-10. And they're assigned by a physician when evaluating a patient. And um, importantly in, in the US, they're, they're really often used for charging purposes. Um, and this can lead to issues, of course, because um, it can, for some uh, diseases or disorders, mean that a particular code is used in order for that uh, interaction with the patient to be charged correctly. Um, it may not necessarily be the, the ideal code for, for a firm diagnosis. Um, we consider these to be a lifetime diagnosis. So once they've been entered into someone's uh, records, uh, they, they stay there. Um, and here I'm just listing some examples of some of the ICD codes um, for autism, major depression and, and cardiovascular disease. And so in um, a phenome-wide association study, which I mentioned earlier, um, is really uh, flipping on the head the, the idea of a genome-wide association study. So as I mentioned, in a, a genome-wide association study, we have our set of cases for a particular disease or disorder and a set of controls. And we look across the genome to identify whether there is a difference in the frequency of a genetic variant between cases and controls. In a phenome-wide association study, we really start with the genetic variant, or in the cases that I'll show you here, a polygenic risk score. And we look across the phenome to see if there are differences in the frequency of phenotypes. Um, so of course, each individual um, may have a single phenotype or, or multiple phenotypes. Now the issue when um, creating uh, these um, phenotypes for, for this analysis is that when we look at ICD codes, and here I'm just showing you um, a, a list of ICD codes for a hypothetical patient, um, you can see, for instance, that a single patient can end up with multiple different ICD codes that really um, are the same sort of disorder. So here we have a code of 309, which represents adjustment disorder with depressed mood, 309.28, adjustment disorder with mixed anxiety and depressed mood, and then F4323, which is then the ICD-10 code um, for the same uh, disorder. And so what fee codes allow us to do is to map all of these um, this, uh, ICD codes to a single fee code um, and, and allows us to group ICD codes that are similar under these sort of parent codes. So here you see all of these ICD codes um, for adjustment disorder fall under a single fee code of 304. Now, the other thing that these feed codes allow us to do is to define controls. So if you have um, a particular ICD code, then you will be assigned um, to be a case uh, for a particular fee code. So here, for instance, um, anyone with an ICD code that is a mood disorder will be assigned the 296 fee code. However, everybody else by default will become a control and we may not want that. We may actually want to exclude some of the individuals. So in this example, I'm showing you that for a um, phenome-wide association study that looks at mood disorder, um, everyone with a mood disorder would become a case. Everybody with any of these other fee codes, such as schizophrenia, suicidal ideation, anxiety, etc., would be excluded from the analysis, and everyone else would become a control. Does anyone have any questions about that part? Um, so the other option is to uh, use domain knowledge. Um, so a physician who really understands the disease or trait phenotype in order to define cases and controls. And um, often this will use uh, defined groups of ICD codes, possibly with the addition of other EHR data. So for instance, um, for someone with bipolar disorder, 
we could say that they're a case if they have two uh, ICD codes on separate days as an outpatient. Um, they could also become a case if they have one ICD code, but it was a, as an inpatient. And then maybe we also want to add in that they need to be um, prescribed medication for bipolar disorder in order to become a case. Okay, so now I'm, I'm going to transition into um, showing you some of our, our findings uh, for substance use disorders um, using um, these EHR-based uh, records. So I'll, I'll start with opioid use disorder. So uh, recently, um, Hong Zhao um, ran a genome-wide association study of opioid use disorder in the Million Veteran Program, Yale Penn, and SAGE studies. Um, this was a, a very large sample size. He had 10,500 opioid use disorder cases and over 72,000 opioid exposed controls. And on the right here, I'm showing you the Manhattan plot uh, for his findings. And only a single um, SNP reached genome-wide significance, this SNP in OPRM1. And the odds ratio for this SNP was 1.07. So not all of the heritability for opioid use disorder can be explained by this single significant GWAS SNP. And we know from previous studies that SNPs that are non-significant, so the SNPs that lie below this red line here also contain real signal. So why are these not significant? Well, it's a combination of um, they having very small effect sizes, um, a stringent multiple testing correction, um, and also possibly uh, the, the phenotyping might, may need to be refined. So what if we want to predict the phenotype in a different sample? Well, this is where we can calculate polygenic risk scores. So a polygenic risk score um, starts with a GWAS finding. So for every single genetic variant in a GWAS, we get an effect size for that variant on the phenotype. And what we can then do is take all of these effect sizes for every genetic variant that's been tested and go to a naive individual shown on the right here. And we can say, does that individual have that genetic variant? And if they do, then we can sum the effect size of that genetic variant. And we can do that across the genome for all of the genetic variants and across multiple individuals, such that each individual ends up with a measure of their genetic risk for that disorder. Does anyone have any questions about that? Sorry, Rachel, when, when you're doing this, you implied mm -hmm. that you're simply summing the inferred effect sizes, but for the effect size, there's gonna be an uncertainty around each of those effect sizes, right? And for the smaller effect sizes and the lower statistical significance for things in that sort of sub-significant band in the GWAS, presumably there's greater uncertainty in the effect size. Is that taken, is that uncertain, do, do more uncertain effect sizes contribute less to the polygenic risk score? Is that taken into account or do you simply sum the central, your, your central estimate of the effect size and hope that it comes out in the wash? Yes, um, so there are a number of different ways to create polygenic risk scores um, and I believe that I have, and yes, I will sum it up a little better in, in this slide. Um, but essentially this, this that I present here is the simplest way. You just take every genetic variant and you just sum it. Um, many people do not do this because of that increased um, noise ratio that you get in the uh, less significant um, thresholds and there's a number of ways to to account for that but, but I'll, I'll explain further in a couple of slides. Uh, are, the, uh, are, are the data that you get from the veterans samples any more reliable than the general population ones in, in the US due to the 
uh, at relative absence of billing considerations in, in, in making diagnoses among the veterans? Um, that's an excellent question. And I don't know for certain. I would certainly assume so. And um, I know that, you know, having everything in a, a single um, system helps. But we, I, I also know that um, even in the system um, across different regions, we may see different ways of coding things. Mm -hmm. And maybe the same thing could apply to the European samples where they have national health insurance and the, the uh, economic things don't, may not play as large a role. Yes. Yeah. Rachel, one other question. Um, many of these alleles vary in their frequency across different ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And um, by GWASs, we know that different variants may associate or implicate you know, be associated with a trait in one population and not another. In deriving polygenic risk scores, therefore, does the polygenic risk score itself have to be derived from a population-specific based GWAS then? Or are there techniques, kind of of the kind that Chris was alluding to, where mm -hmm. one can derive a universal polygenic risk score that's weighted based on those kinds of considerations? Mm -hmm. Um, ideally, yes, we would have genome-wide association studies that have been performed in the population that we then want to predict in. Um, and so because of that, the, the results that I'm showing you today um, are really all in Europeans. Um, the advantage of uh, access to the Million Veteran Program is that we do also have a fairly large sample of African Americans. And so we've been able to um, run genome wide association studies in that sample. And um, I actually have a, a paper up on bioarchives that's um, in cardiometabolic disease um, that does show that when we use the um, African specific G was, um, we have a, a better polygenic risk score in the Africans. Um, but the European specific G was does still um, have some level of association in the Africans. So it's not completely useless. It's just um, the, the, the effect is, is reduced. Um, uh, Rachel, um, mm -hmm. I would like to know if in your review you're going to get to uh, the use of biomarkers as opposed to uh, either DSM or ICD diagnoses. Um, I was very much involved with the latest revision of uh, the um, diagnostic, the DSM. There was a, a lot of controversy over the fact that uh, these diagnostic criteria are, are really not phenomenic. Um, they're pretty much behavioral, um, mm -hmm. has so much unreliability in it. But, but there are some potential biomarkers, and uh, has there been any attempt to include, like for example, level of alcohol reactivity that Mark Shuckett has developed? I mean, it, it has, I think, strong uh, evidence of a, um, uh, a genetic component, mm -hmm. but um, but it, it's uh, as far as I know, it's never really been uh, in uh, co combined or integrated with the studies that uh, you're presenting right now. Yes, yes, you're you're right, and um, that's certainly one of the next steps that we want to look at. Um, in fact, at the uh, very end here, one of the next steps I mention is um, using um, the, the PET uh, center um, to look at, uh, for instance, binding potential um, for, for various uh, genetic um, liability um, for, 
for different disorders. Um, so that's that's something we want to get to, but it's it's not uh, something that I think is being done on a large scale yet. Okay. Um, all right, so this uh, part of research that I'm going to show you is uh, conducted in the Penn Medicine Biobank. Um, the Penn Biobank provides researchers with centralized access to blood and tissue samples with um, links to their uh, each individual's EHR. Um, there's currently about 60,000 individuals enrolled in the Biobank um, with multiple different ancestries. Um, the data that I'll show you today is um, based just in 10,000 or so European individuals with genetic information. Um, so here's a little bit more detail on the polygenic risk score methods that, that we've been using. Um, so we used the uh, summary statistics from the uh, GWAS run by Hung um, for opioid use disorder. And for this study, we used the clumping and thresholding method um, for uh, creating polygenic risk scores. So instead of just um, taking every single genetic variant um, in the genome and adding and summing um, their, their effect size within each new individual, what we first do is we actually clump all of the SNPs into LD blocks. So these are blocks um, of SNPs that tend to travel together when passed down from parent to child. Um, and then within each LD block, we select the most significant SNP from that block based on p-value. Um, so we're not taking every single SNP, we're just uh, selecting within each LD block um, a single SNP to, to represent that LD block. Um, and we further then also limit which SNPs we select based on p-value thresholding. Um, so here uh, you can see a, a Manhattan plot. And for instance, what we would start off by doing is taking a more stringent approach. So we only select SNPs that pass this particular p-value. So these would be the most significant SNPs. Um, and then we become more and more lenient um, reducing the, the p-value threshold of association to include a larger and larger number of SNPs each time. Um, for the work that I'll show you here, we, we selected nine particular um, p-value cutoffs to create nine polygenic risk scores. Does anyone have any questions about that? I should also mention that there are other ways to account for the um, for the noise and the the LD um, within these summary statistics there's there's a method called LD pred um, that I've also used um, that doesn't really throw out any snips um, it merely uh, adjusts the effect sizes of the snips based on um, the LD relationship So in order to determine the, the best polygenic risk score, we created these nine different polygenic risk scores at each p-value threshold and tested for the association of the polygenic risk score with an opioid use disorder phenotype. We determined the opioid use disorder phenotype just based on ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. Um, we did first restrict these, um, the codes that we looked at to a, a subset of encounters that represent encounters with an actual physician um, so we wanted to remove instances where um, the ICD codes were really just administrative. Um, out of our 52,000 Penn Medicine Biobank individuals, only 566 actually had um, one code for opioid use disorder. And out of our 10,100 um, European individuals with uh, corresponding genetic data, 85 have a code for opioid use disorder. And this breaks down into 64 males, 21 females, um, with a mean age of about 62. Um, this is a very low prevalence, um, and it could be for a number of different reasons. It could be that um, the uh, more individuals have an opioid use disorder phenotype, and this isn't being adequately captured by the um, EHR record. It um, might be, for instance, if they encountered the PEN system 
um, due to having a heart attack or something that they may not have um, been diagnosed with opioid use disorder while they are interacting with the pen system. Um, it's also possible that there's a selection bias. So people that have enrolled into Pen Medicine Biobank um, may have uh, reduced uh, substance use. Um, so in order to test for association of the polygenic risk score, um, we use the logistic regression model um, to test between um, the polygenic risk score and the opioid use phenotype. And we included age, sex and uh, principal components as covariates. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, since you have this huge uh, unbalance uh, between cases and controls, mm -hmm. did you apply any adjustment uh, to avoid uh, any bias uh, in the analysis? No, what, what sort of thing would you recommend? Like, uh, because uh, we saw, especially for, uh, like, because I expect, uh, like, the opioid you was in MBP is, is underpowered. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it has a relatively small sample size. So I would expect also the distribution of the, of the score could be a problem. So maybe to, first of all, double check the distribution of the score. And uh, another thing that you may want to do is to perform a permutation analysis to see if this kind of uh, uh, unbalance in the case control ratio could inflate uh, the, the results of the polygenic score. So you find a significant association, but not because there is a real association, but because there is a weird distribution of the score with respect to this uh, tiny number of, uh, of cases. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, um, that, that's, that's an excellent suggestion. I, um, I think when I show you the, um, the results uh, with the number of cases um, in each uh, decile of, of score, that may hint to you even further that we need to do something like this. Um, I should also mention that this was uh, partly done just really as a proof of principle um, to see uh, if we can identify individuals at higher genetic risk that we then may want to use for, for our pet um, studies. So this, this was a sort of work in progress. What criteria for opioid use disorder at ICD-10 has harmful use and independence in ICD-10? DSM-4, I presume you were using those as abuse or dependence. Were you using, when you, you say opiate use disorder, were you lumping them all together or were you just focusing on dependence, you know? That's a good question. I can't off the top of my head remember, but there's the, um, it's basically the ICD codes that were from the summary table um, in Hung's paper. Mm -hmm. um, so I can, I can look that up afterwards and, and let you know. I just can't we, off the top of my head remember. Have user. If it's uh, OUD, then yeah. uh, oh, there you go. abuser, yeah. <laughs> Again, so it's a little bit, yeah, so uh, we included abuser. It's a little different from the DS4 uh, opioid dependence. Right. So that, you might want to just introduce a lot more heterogeneity by including that de dependence is, is pretty reliable mm -hmm. um, uh, diagnosis. There's uh, others are, are not, I don't think they're quite as reliable. Mm -hmm. Just a comment. I have another question. Um, regarding the controls, because in ANG analysis in MVP, he compared the uh, OUD cases versus exposed controls. Mm -hmm. Did you limit the analysis only in the exposed controls? You no, not, not yet. Not yet for this. Um, we've only recently received uh, medication data for this sample. Um, so that's one of the next steps. But the uh, medication data is, um, is rather messy in the format that I've yeah. been given it. So it's going to take um, a bit of cleaning up to, <laughs> to get to that stage. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, we created nine different uh, polygenic risk scores. And for each of these, uh, we tested for the association with opioid use disorder. Um, 
And here I'm showing you the, the odds ratio and the p-value and the um, AUC for, for each of these. And you can see that um, not all of the uh, polygenic risk score based on different thresholds is, is significantly associated. Um, they start to become associated with phenotype, um, actually at a, a, a less stringent p-value threshold. Um, and the most significantly associated risk score is, is this one at the 0 0.05 level. So what does that actually look like? Um, well, as I mentioned, we really only have 85 individuals um, with opioid use disorder in, in this sample. Um, and so we calculated the case prevalence per decile of polygenic risk. And here um, I'm showing you a, a graph of this uh, with the, the polygenic risk on the x-axis and the percentage of um, cases on the y-axis. And then here I'm just showing you that in table format so you can really see the hard numbers. So you can see that the polygenic risk score is associated um, and what that translates to is um, in the lowest decile of polygenic risk, um, about 0.5% of individuals are diagnosed with opioid use disorder, compared to in the top decile, 1.57% of individuals are diagnosed with opioid use disorder. However, it's, it's clearly not um, a, a sort of clean association. Um, you can see a lot of variability in this, and this may very well be due to the um, low number of cases that we have. One minor suggestion, since the number is really low, maybe it would have been better to show quartile instead of decile. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, or, or quintiles or something. Yeah. Um, so the current clinical relevance of these really is uh, fairly limited, right? The, the PRS is, is associated with the phenotype. You know, we can see Here's a you know, significant p-value for association, a, a 1.5 odds ratio. Um, but it's not predictive yet in a naive patient. You know, we can't go to a, a naive individual and say, you have this polygenic risk score, so you are at risk of being a case, and, and you're not. Um, as GWAS sample sizes increase, we do expect that genetic variants associated with disease will be identified more accurately with more accurate effect sizes, and this will allow us to improve our polygenic risk scores. Um, but meanwhile, what can we do with these? So there's, there's many other avenues of research, and um, one of these is these uh, phenome-wide association studies that, that I mentioned. So here's our phenome-wide association study of, of the opioid use disorder polygenic risk score. So this is similar um, to the Manhattan plots that I presented to you before, except along the x-axis are all the different phenotypes. Um, and on the y-axis is the uh, p-value association with that particular phenotype. So the polygenic risk score for opioid use disorder, in addition to being associated with opioid use disorder, is associated with substance addiction and disorders more generally. It's associated with bipolar disorder, anxiety, tobacco use, for instance. Um, we haven't quite figured out um, whether there is any uh, interest in, in these sort of more medical findings. Um, for instance, a decrease uh, association with um, paralysis of vocal cords, uh, that, that may be, um, extraneous finding. Um, we do also see that it's associated with an increase in, in back pain and spinal stenosis. And so th this could be um, that individuals um, may be experiencing more pain um, and therefore are exposed to opioids and develop opioid use disorder. Um, it could also be that individuals with opioid use disorder are reporting more pain. So we need to do more work to, to uncover um, whether these are um, the sort of uh, vertical or horizontal pleiotropic associations that I mentioned previously. Okay, so that brings us to um, the, the next um, part of the talk, which is genetic liability for alcohol consumption 
Uh, does anyone have any further questions about the opioid use disorder section? Can I ask a um, quick technical question about doing the FIWAS? Because mm -hmm. I'm not super familiar with it. So when you do that, when you're selecting the different um, phenotypes to consider, are you taking into account um, the fact that there might be differences in contribution from common variants to different disorders? Like if one disorder has a more significant common variant component, is that expected to make it more likely to come up significant in any sort of FIWAS? Um, that's a good question. The idea of the polygenic risk score is not only that you're just counting how many common variants an individual has, but also that that common variant is being weighted by its effect size for that particular phenotype. And so you wouldn't expect that um, certain phenotypes would come up again and again across multiple different polygenic risk scores, I don't think. Um, but really for the FIWAS, all you're doing is for each individual phenotype, you're running a logistic regression, saying, does this polygenic risk score vary between cases and controls for substance addiction? Does it vary between cases and controls for anxiety disorder and, and so on? So I don't know if that helps with your understanding of that. So it should be like independent of the actual genetic makeup of the ideology of that disorder? Ideally, yes. Okay, thank but you. May very well not be in practice. Okay, thanks. Rachel, I'll just add a quick comment that's essentially a follow-on to George's comment. Um, would it be worthwhile or are there enough numbers to actually limit your um, phenotype to people who have the full-on, flat-out opioid use disorder, not, as George was highlighting, only abuse, in terms of tightening it up or making it a more extreme you know, version of the phenotype so that might refine it is are there numbers that would permit that of the 85 do, do you have any idea how many would be meeting full criteria for use disorder and not quote unquote abuse as in dsm4 um i don't i don't know off the top of my head but i can look um i have the icd codes that each individual's um been assigned um right. Right. A good way to screen for that would be just to take people who are on methadone or buprenorphine because current physiological dependence is a, sort of a criteria for that disorder, current or recent or past, and that would get your more severe group in there. Right, and, she will, and you will have the medication data that may help with that. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. We just received the medication data a couple of weeks ago, um, but they essentially gave me um, every medication that anyone in the biobank has ever received. And so it was a file that was millions <laughs> of lines long. Yeah. You, you, want the one, a lot of, you know, methadone is used for pain sometimes too, and they're not necessarily addicted. So if you get people in the methadone programs or in the buprenorphine maintenance program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although the more you stratify yeah. in these ways, the, the, your N is going to get smaller quickly. For yeah, sure. that's why that's yeah. why I was wondering if it, if the sample size would permit it. But yeah, it's, uh, so you're fighting sample size, but it's just in terms of getting something that's again a, a, the, the more refined phenotype. But from a conceptual standpoint, I think you know, I mean, it's an empiric question to be answered that we don't know based on the genetic landscape of opiate use disorder slash abuse. Um, I mean, I'll use another example from psychiatric genetics, and that is is that. Let's suppose you felt it was just critical to limit your diagnostic specificity to DSM for schizophrenia and eliminate all those instances where you saw DSM schizotypal personality disorder. Mm -hmm. um, sure. The truth of the matter is, is that we know that those are on a genetic continuum today. And right. you add lots of information to that by including those actually and actually strengthen your chances, I think, for findings. And, I don't know if Joel or Renato agree with that, but that's a kind of a, 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 another example in psychiatric genetics that I think it's, it raises the question here whether 
a pure diagnosis would give you more power or dilute your power. No, I think it's a good point. And, and you know, that was part of the argument when people were doing the DSM-5 work about whether or not these things should really be viewed as a continuum or whether or not uh, they were distinct in some ways. The people who, you know, were stuck at the quote-unquote abuse criteria never really progressed, whether it was really a distinct entity. And they finally decided that probably it wasn't. And they decided to do mild, medium, mild moderate, severe, blah, blah, blah. So it's a good point. Yeah. Um, also, Part of the problem here with, especially with opioid use disorder, is that the word dependence for years was used inappropriately and led to a lot of confusion. So if you used um, being on any opioid, uh, even if at a high dose, uh, that wouldn't necessarily mean a use disorder if they were taking it for pain. Um, DSM-4 had that problem. Uh, by using the word abuse and dependence, and we corrected that in DSM-5. Yeah, and it, it may be that the, well, in, in fact, it's very likely that the Penn Medicine Biobank is not currently set up to answer these sorts of questions, um, and there are other data sets um, that may be better suited to answering these questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll now run through some of the um, it's very similar work, but for um, alcohol consumption. And um, part of the reason for showing you this is, is to show you um, what we can do uh, in a slightly larger sample size. So this um, work is using the Million Veteran Program, which I m mentioned earlier, is a single cohort, very large sample size, multiple ancestries, and um, for alcohol, we have both the alcohol consumption measure, um, which is the um, alcohol use disorders identification test, um, the first three questions, um, and alcohol use disorder diagnosis based on ICD-9 and ICD-10. Um, again, we created uh, polygenic risk scores. Uh, this time we used summary statistics from AG was performed in the UK Biobank for the full alcohol use disorders identification test. Um, so this was the full 10 questions. We created polygenic risk scores for over 200,000 European ancestry individuals, again using the clumping and thresholding method that I mentioned previously. Um, and again, we uh, calculated risk scores based on nine different p-value thresholds. So the first thing we did was test to see whether the polygenic risk score for audit was significantly associated with either um, our measures of audit C um, or our case control status for, for AUD. Um, and so here I'm showing you a forest plot for the uh, various um, polygenic risk scores and the association with both audit C and AUD. And you can see that all of the polygenic risk scores were significantly associated. Um, and I think uh, in this case, the um, p-value threshold of one to the minus five um, was, was the best performing. So again, what does this translate to in terms of case prevalence of alcohol use disorder? Well, this line here is, is slightly smoother, um, and a large part of this is because um, we have uh, many more individuals with alcohol use disorder compared to the number of individuals with opioid use disorder that we had in Penn Medicine Biobank. Despite this, however, we, um, we see that in the, if you're in the top decile of polygenic risk, so the highest level of, of polygenic risk, 18.5% of individuals have alcohol use disorder, compared to if you're in the lowest decile of polygenic risk, 14.6% of individuals have alcohol use disorder. So again, a clear association, but the ability to predict in a naive individual um, is still limited. So again, we can perform a phenome-wide association study um, based on your genetic risk for um, alcohol use. 
And when we do this in the Million Veteran Programme, we see uh, positive phenotypic associations with, as we would expect, alcohol-related disorder, alcoholic liver damage, and more broadly, substance addiction and disorders. Interestingly, we see negative phenotypic associations with calculus of kidney, gout, hypothyroidism, and hypoglyceridemia. And um, we need to do a further breakdown to see why um, these associations would actually be um, in the uh, negative direction as your genetic risk for alcohol use increases. So our conclusions from these studies. Um, GWAS studies uh, are really starting to identify uh, variants that are associated with substance use disorders. Um, we can use polygenic risk scores to explain a larger amount of phenotypic variation than just single SNPs alone. And when we do this, we can see that polygenic risk scores are associated with the expected phenotypes in an independent sample. And they can also identify secondary phenotypes that are associated with genetic liability for the disorder. However, because of their limited predictive power, clinical relevance is still currently limited. So I would argue that they're not prime time ready just yet. So what are our next steps? Well, as I mentioned earlier, and as a, a couple of you mentioned as well, um, larger GWAS, um, better GWAS, perhaps based on um, more specific phenotypes, um, and GWAS that are in multiple different ancestries to allow us to predict, um, not just within Europeans. Um, all of these will allow us to create more powerful polygenic risk scores um, in the hope that we will move towards a measure of genetic risk that becomes predictive in a naive patient. Until then, um, we can test the association of these polygenic risk scores with intermediate phenotypes. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we're currently looking at a project to see if genetic liability for opioid use disorder is associated with variation in opioid neurotransmission using um, positron emission tomography neuroimaging. Um, particularly, we're looking at the binding potential of the mu opioid receptor. Um, and we've actually uh, got an initial project um, that's a collaboration with a number of uh, different labs um, showing that there may be differences in binding potential based on an individual's polygenic risk for opioid use disorder. And this is in individuals um, that do not have opioid use disorder. So this is just their genetic risk. Um, we can also incorporate uh, measures of the environment. So I, I mentioned at the very beginning that um, psychiatric genetics has previously looked at gene environment interactions. Um, using a polygenic risk score instead of a single genetic variant allows us to capture more of the genetic variation. Um, and then this may allow us to really see if um, environmental interactions um, can moderate that genetic risk. Um, and there's also a lot, a lot of discussion going on about how to incorporate these polygenic risk scores into clinical prediction models. Um, in the cardiovascular realm, uh, this research is already quite far along. They already have these incredibly detailed um, prediction models that is based on um, lipid levels and family history and other health factors and age and so on. And so the question is, can we add in genetic risk to those um, models that are already used? Um, do they add anything? Um, how do we incorporate them? You know, do they uh, interact with, with the various components um, or can they just be added? And of course, this may look very different for different disorders. Um, so what that looks like in psychiatry, I think is uh, still to be determined. Okay, so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Hank Kranzler uh, for being a mentor throughout this, um, Hang Zhao for uh, his work with the opioid use disorder uh, GWAS, um, and particularly the participants of both the biobanks that I've mentioned today, the Penn Medicine Biobank and the Million Veteran Program. Uh, so with that, does anyone have any questions or open this up for, for discussion? I have one question. Mm -hmm. 
Did you think about the conditioning your PRS result for other PRS? One thing that could be interesting because there is the cross disorder you was that combine mm -hmm. more, that should represent the overall genetic liability to develop a, a general psychiatric disorder. So to add that PRS in the, your significant result to so see if the association that you are observing is specific for the trait that you are testing or instead is to, to add more shared liability toward the psychiatric vulnerability? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I have thought about doing that. Um, I haven't determined yet what the best method would be. So one option would be simply to include um, a polygenic risk of um, cross disorder, for instance, as a covariate in the um, in the model. Um, another option would be to adjust the summary statistics um, to start with, right, using uh, something like um, MTAG. Um, Empty code. So, yeah, thank you, um, Kojo, to, to, um, to, to adjust those to start with and then just create um, a single polygenic risk score. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've tried either of those or if you'd recommend one method over the other for a particular reason. I think they are very similar. They should give probably the, a very close result to each other. And uh, regarding your uh, imaging analysis, um, how large is the sample that you are planning to investigate? Because that could be a problem, especially with the uh, opioid uh, PRS that is generated on a smaller keywords. Did you do some power calculation? No, sorry, say that again. About um, the imaging study that you are planning to do for mm -hmm. the opioid. Like, um, I, I'm wondering if the, the sample size, because I expect it would be a relatively small sample size due to the cost of the assessment. So did you do some power calculation to know what to expect? Um, no, not yet. Yeah, this, this was um, the... Uh, PET center, which um, other people on the call may be able to speak better about, but the initial plan was really just to use a single genetic variant. Um, and then we moved on to the idea of using a polygenic risk score. And the collaboration we have um, with uh, Yong Ka Zubieta um, and his colleagues um, showed that I think it was in about 150 people that where they had um, a, a studies of the binding potential, there was an association um, in particular brain regions. Um, so that was a sort of, um, again, a, yeah, a genre. Genre. but, but for, for the, for the, um, for the pet project that we plan to do, we will have to run a power calculation. I mean, I, the, good, I, the good news is that John Carr had, what is it, a hundred and some that will mm -hmm. be useful? already collected so um yeah, so yeah, I mean, I mean, the, yeah statistics could be daunting in terms of doing you know hundreds of new pets with the pilot project wouldn't be possible but you can examine these possibilities in the existing carfentanil data set by probing for oud prs scores if i'm understanding yeah. yes exactly yeah i think the one caveat there was and i think hank alluded to this was that um it is an ethnically mixed pet sample. So out of the 150, I can't recall the breakdown in terms of European Americans and African Americans. So it was a subset of that. But is, is that in the range that you were thinking, um, Renato? Or are you skeptical that the effect sizes went for an imaging phenotype like that are gonna be too small still? Um, yeah, I would be. Yeah, for the PRS. But uh, since, uh, like, I'm not a big fan of uh, single variant testing, but since uh, the OPRM1 variant, the coding variant, came back with the GWAS, maybe that's the one that I would go. And maybe for that one, the power would be a little bit better. Because, the, uh, like, actually, the PRS for the pen medicine result worked better than I expected. So that, that's good. Yes. But the <laughs> that's the I, I, so Renato, that's exactly um, what I thought when I saw it. So I, I did actually test just the OPRM1 variant in Penn Medicine Biobank against cases and controls and found no association. 
Um, and so I was surprised when the polygenic risk score showed us showed an association because I I don't think that the polygenic risk score is particularly powerful. Um, and also we clearly have a very poorly defined case control sample. Yeah. Um, and yet it is picking up some signals. This gave me some hope um, as this work moves forward that we, we may be able to find something. Yeah, the, the fact that you did replicate OPRM1, because in PGC, we have the PGC opioid dependent GWOS that is much smaller than the, the MVP. Mm -hmm. OPRM1 is, it's not significant at all. So it's, it's a variant that seems okay in MVP, but outside MVP in some courses is not there. So the effect size is small. So that could be the heterogeneity, but I don't mm. know. Yeah, the BRS is surprising. It seems like really nice and it works like, uh, the, the prevalence difference is not that big, but it's something we expect. Looking at MVP alone, we didn't reach statistical significance. We had to add in Yale Penn to do that. And then we proxy replicated the finding in UK Biobank. So it's clearly not an MVP limited finding. Yeah, like, but in, in, in PGC, like, uh, except for the Yale Penn, all the other courses, the variant was not significant. And the UK Biobank, there was the issue with the small number of cases. Uh, so it seems a real result, I agree, and Hung did an amazing job to double, triple check the result, but I'm still kind of, not skeptical, but how large is the effect size, what we are seeing, yeah. Well, it was a small number of cases, but it replicated it better than P.05 in UK Biobank, and that was the only variant we tested. Yeah, I, it, it, maybe I'm used to, now that we have this huge sample for a lot of phenotypes, I'm used to better replication. And, uh, um, Rachel, I would, I would like to hear your reaction to um, the addition of a um, medication or treatment response as another aspect of the polygenic risk, risk factor. Uh, and I'm, I'm especially thinking of for alcohol use disorder where the medication that was first approved by the FDA for treatment efficacy in alcohol uh, use disorder uh, is now Trexone, blocking opiate receptors. And, and the PET study of uh, the, both uh, opiate receptor and, and presumably um, uh, ligands as well. Uh, but uh, there, there's a dichotomy as someone who's given now Trexone to a lot of alcohol patients over the years, there's a real dichotomy in terms of medication reactivity. So in some cases, it works so beautifully because it blocks the reward from an alcohol. At other times, it doesn't work at all. So when you mix them all together, you get a low or moderate uh, effect size. But in fact, clinically, it's dramatic. And it just seems to me that this is something that has to be genetics. And if you're going to invent a polygenic uh, risk profile, uh, we ought to think of some way that you could integrate the treatment response into the class of variables. Certainly. Um, our, our group has, has a lot of interest in the uh, sort of pharmacogenetics of, of polygenic risk. Um, and we, we haven't done that work yet, um, but I, I would be very interested to know, for instance, that if the patients that respond better to a particular medication, um, are those the ones whose phenotype um, really was very genetically driven to start with? Um, so perhaps the individuals in the highest polygenic risk, um, whereas maybe individuals that don't respond as well, um, they're actually, uh, they have lower polygenic risk for that particular phenotype. And it could be um, that they, they um, uh, the environment plays a much larger role. Um, that's, that's all just sort of theoretical at the moment. Um, it hasn't been tested, um, but that's, that's the way I think um, 
some some of people in the in the fields are moving to, to look at that sort of thing. Um, I mean, if anyone has, you know, SNP chip data on sets of individuals who um, have uh, things like naltrexone response recorded, we can certainly generate polygenic risk scores for them and, and test that. Uh, Rachel, I have a question. I'm one of the, the trainees, and this is maybe a trainee level question. Oh. Um, but uh, so, you know, for alcohol use disorder, you know, my understanding is there's uh, a few variants that we know have uh, really strong effect size, like if you have two mutations in ALDH2, you have a strong sort of protection. Um, how, how, what's the intuition behind thinking about adding additional? Uh, additional variants, and that, in fact, seems to dilute the effect size of uh, certain uh, mutations that we know do have strong effect size. So, um, and there, you know, I understand there might be sort of a, a population ethnic-based component to it, so that a polygenic risk score might be uh, more powerful in an Asian sample where that that uh, mutation has a higher prevalence. Um, yeah, I, I guess in general, how do we think about that? Does adding those additional, um, adding additional like sort of polygenic uh, mutations sort of dilute away the significance of things that we already know? And does that speak to um, maybe having a more um, limited set of variants that we use instead of a, a larger set? Right. Um... So I, I guess it depends how you think about it. Um, biologically, it certainly uh, diffuses um, our understanding of, of the disorder because um, we're not just using, you know, the, the very top variants. Um, often, you know, we know how they function and why, why they're affecting disorder. Um, but overall, we've consistently shown that a polygenic risk score that includes thousands of genetic variants um, really does show a better association with um, the phenotype than a sort of cluster or, you know, just, just a few of the um, genetic variants, such as the um, ADH1B SNP, for instance. Um, and one of the advantages, is, as you mentioned, is, is allele frequency. So some of the genetic variants that have the largest effect sizes um, are not that common. And so if you, if you have a bunch of individuals that don't have that genetic variant, you really can't say anything about them. Um, but if you're using a polygenic risk score, which captures many genetic variants and many effect sizes, um, then, then you, you can um, have, have some measure of, of their genetic risk. Is the intuition that the polygenic risk score includes some measure of the population frequency of the uh, of the variant? It doesn't, but you do, uh, and that's where you. That's the individual's data, yeah. Yeah, that's that's based on the individual, not the the population level, and that's partly why you want. Um, you know, if you're predicting in a European sample, you want to use a GWAS from, from Europeans and um, so on. Um, Listen, if I, I could... I hesitate to cut off questions, but it's, um, it's one o'clock. And uh, Daniel, I encourage you to just follow up with um, Rachel directly, if you don't mind. Sure. Hey, listen, yeah. Rachel, I want to thank you so much for talking to the group today and all thank the rest you, of you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. This was great. All the, all the great Thanks. questions. Thanks, Rachel, and glad we could record it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So long, everybody. Stay well, everyone. Take care.